Good morning, friends, and Merry Christmas. It is so good to be gathered with you in uh, the Sunday that is still part of the Christmas season. I, I feel the need to remind folks uh, of this every year. When we say the 12 days of Christmas, that is the 12 days Christmas Day and following. We are still celebrating Christmas. So however uh, worn out you may be from your holidays, uh, whatever uh, activities you may have been taking part in that you are now taking a breath and a rest from, that is also Christmas. That is also celebrating the birth of our Savior. And I hope that you're enjoying it. And with that, let us settle back in our seats. Let's take a moment to take a deep breath. I know I usually need one after the holidays. And remember that God is breath, God is spirit, God is with us in our busyness and our rest. Rest in God. Breathe deep the breath of God and let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Let us rise in body or spirit and join in the call to worship. Praise God in the heavens. Praise God among us. Praise the Holy One. Praise God who vindicates us. Praise God who sustains us. Praise God from the depths. Praise God in all circumstances. Praise Creator who made us. Praise God who shapes us. Let all praise the name of the Holy One. The glory of God reigns in heaven and on earth. Praise the Holy One. Let us join together in our gathering hymn, Good Christian Men Rejoice. Let us join together in our opening prayer. Redeeming God, you have met us in valleys, on storming seas, and on mountaintops. We welcome your presence now as we come to worship you. We gather in gratitude and assurance that you are our God, and we proclaim with gladness that we are your people. Some come in need of encouragement or comfort. Others need a healing touch. 
We hunger and thirst for righteousness as we praise and honor your name. Transform us to be living vessels of your love and living witnesses of your continuing presence in the world as we pray in the words of your son Jesus, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. may be seated. And do we have any children here this morning? I'd like to come forward. Come forward and join me. Hello, good morning. How are you doing? Thank you. How are you? Doing all right. <laughs> so this, uh, this is New Year's Eve, right? Uh, we, we get to have church on New Year's Eve. Um, and one thing that uh, you know people talk about a lot around uh, the the New Year's is resolutions, right? Um, have you ever made a New Year's resolution? Yeah. Yeah. Any any uh, you don't have to, but any, any resolutions that you've made that you want to share? Yeah, they're secret. <laughs> That's okay too. <laughs> Well, I, I know that uh, for me and a lot of the people I, I talk to, um, a lot of resolutions are, are usually about something you, you want to do or something you want to be that's different from right now, right? And they can feel really inspiring, like, you know, uh, say if, if you want to exercise more in the new year, right? Like, that, that can feel really exciting to be like, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna to do, do more running or, or, uh, or do more uh, working out. Um, but then, you know, they can also get uh, kind of daunting, you know, if, if, you're, if your New Year's resolution is, is I'm going to, you know, run every week and you haven't run twice in the past year, you know, that's, that's going to start feeling like kind of a lot. But, you know, it's, it's a lot of pressure on, on you to, to do this thing that you've set out to do. So one thing that I, I think uh, people sometimes don't think about when they're making New Year's resolutions is remembering that whatever we attempt, if, if it is something that God wants to see in us or in the world, we're not attempting it alone. God is always with us, and God is our partner in anything that we're doing that would help others or help ourselves. So, you know, maybe there, there are some resolutions that we could make that might be about what we can do that, that God might like to see in the world. So something that I, I think about when I'm thinking about resolutions is, is spending some time in prayer first and, and saying, you know, God, here's, here's some things I think I'd like to see in the world this coming year. What would you like to see in the world this year? And then remembering that when we make that resolution, God is going to be there with us. And so something I'll, I'll also sometimes say is, you know, I'll say, this is my resolution with the help of God. You know, when, when people uh, may make promises, make covenants, uh, like marriage or baptism, we'll sometimes say, I promise this with the help of God. And that's to say that we're not doing this alone. God is, is going to be there for us. Um, and we can make promises that God would like to see happen in the world. Does that sound like something that you could do with, with some of your resolutions? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
So let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for being with us in the things we do. Help us to make resolutions that bring more love into the world. Help us to bring your kingdom here on earth. Amen. Thank you so much. And now is the time when we remember our generosity, when we think about the things that we can offer to God and offer to one another. There is a basket in the back where you can leave offerings and you can also give online. Let us rejoice in the God of salvation through our giving. May we embody the generosity modeled by Jesus Christ who came to serve, heal, and to restore. join together in our prayer of dedication. Generous God, we thank you for every good thing and perfect gift you have given to us and through us. Use our offerings this day for the benefit of creation, the redemption of humanity, and your glory. Amen. You may be seated. And now is the time when we gather together in prayer to share our joys and concerns with one another and with God. What joys or concerns are on your hearts and minds today, friends? Please leave a comment or send us an email with your joys and concerns, and we will pray for you. Let us pray together. God of hope, peace, joy, love, and light, we gather in your name this Christmas season and lift our prayers to you. Thank you for the gifts of Advent and Christmas, O oh God, for the hope for a brighter future, for peace in our relationships and within ourselves, for the joy of shared laughter and voices raised in song, for the love of friends, family, and community and especially for the light of our beloved Jesus, born anew in our hearts. Christmas is a time to remember our blessings, and we remember them with joyful praise and a thankful heart. And at the same time, God, we pray for those who did not receive all of these gifts this Christmas, for all who are despairing and cannot find hope, for the people of Palestine, Israel, Ukraine, Russia, and anywhere else where peace is hard to find. For the grieving, the suffering, and all who need more joy in their lives. For the lonely and isolated who feel unloved or have not found anyone to show love to. Be with all these, O oh God. Remind them that your love and the light of all that Christmas is can reach them, no matter who or where they are. Let us all know that we are not alone in what we face. Hear now the silent prayers of this gathered community.
Amen. Let us join together in our sermon hymn, In the Bleak Midwinter. seated. Our scripture this morning is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 22 through 40. When the time came for their purification according to the law of Moses, Mary and Joseph brought Jesus up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. 
It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. And the child's father and mother were amazed at what was being said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to his mother Mary, This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be opposed, so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age, having lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, then as a widow to the age of 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped there with fasting and prayer night and day. At that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. When they had finished everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. The child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. These are holy words. Thanks be to God. Greetings, friends. It is so wonderful to be with you this Sunday after Christmas, still in the season of celebrating the birth of our Lord. I have been doing my best to take a restful December, and so have not preached anywhere since I last saw you all. So instead, I bring you the Christmas greetings of my family, my mother, my stepfather, my brother, and my stepbrother and his partner, who I was blessed to celebrate with this year. They all send their greetings and remind me that whenever two or more are gathered in the name of our God, it is church. And I hope to bring your Christmas greetings to another gathered community soon. This morning, I'm not entirely sure if my thoughts line up to make a cohesive sermon. I did try, but I'm talking in large part about time. And whenever someone tries to talk about time, I at least usually get lost. So bear with me. Our text this morning tells the story of what happens when Mary and Joseph present Jesus at the temple in Jerusalem, 40 days after his birth. As Luke tells us, this is a ceremony prescribed in the Torah, something every family in Judea did for their firstborn son. And so it was already going to be a special moment for Mary and Joseph a time for celebrating the birth of their child and participating in a -a once-in-a-lifetime ritual that united them with their people. And, as so often happens where baby Jesus is concerned, this ceremony becomes even more special because two elders of the community recognize Jesus for who he is, the Messiah, And they join the ceremony, praising God, sharing the good news with those gathered, and offering blessings and prophecy to the Holy Family. I have always found this story incredibly comforting. Because to me, it shows a continuity between past, present, and future. 
and a commitment to ushering in a good future. Simeon and Anna are elders. They have seen much change and strife in the political and religious orders of their world. They have, as far as we can tell, kept alive the traditions handed down by their ancestors. Prayer, fasting, caring for their community, offering service at the temple. And frankly, I think a lot of people in their position might not be expected to recognize Jesus. Jesus, after all, represents something new new ways of understanding our relations to one another and to God, new ways of thinking about power, new ways of gathering and worship. Now, knowing that uh, several in this congreg congregation could be considered elders, I hope no one takes any offense when I say older people don't always take well to new things. We all know the stereotypes of older folk, set in their ways, claiming they are too old to learn or change or grow. But Simeon and Anna, and honestly, many elders in my own life, including many in this community, remind me that those are only stereotypes. True for some, maybe, but not at all universal. Anna and Simeon embrace this new thing immediately, literally embracing this child who represent the, represents the first steps towards all that they hoped and prayed for. In their embracing of him, they remind his family and us that every new thing has its roots in something older. Jesus is a new beginning, yes, but he is also a continuation of a people's long and intense relationship with God, and their longing for a world where they are closer to one another and to the divine. That would have been true even if Simeon and Anna had not embraced Jesus. But their doing so creates a mutual understanding of that connection. The child, as he grows, will know that he is both a new beginning and a continuation of something old. And his elders have shown that they fully know and embrace his newness and welcome him as their legacy. Anna and Simeon will not see Jesus's ministry. They will have no control over what he does with the Jewish faith they have practiced all their lives. But they place their trust in God and in him and embrace everything that he will bring, even knowing that some of it will be painful. As I grow older, I find myself more and more grateful for the wisdom of my elders. And along, that, along with that, gratitude for those who continue to learn, grow, and change throughout their lives, acknowledging that the world will move beyond the things that were once familiar and constant. I listen attentively to the stories of my one living grandmother and my great aunt, and I hope to the elders in the churches I worship with. And I do my best to learn about the worlds they have lived in and what they have learned from them. And I treasure the moments when they look at me and say, there's so much new happening in the world today. And I'm so excited for what you and your generation will do. I receive their blessing. And I also acknowledge the responsibility of the trust they have placed in me. When Simeon blesses Jesus and his family, I'm struck by the fact that he does not shy away from the fact that the future will not always be comfortable. He says to Mary 
This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Simeon, as Luke has already told us, receives insight from the Holy Spirit. And so, likely, he is prophesying about what we know will come. The conflicts that arise in response to Jesus' ministry, conflicts that will cause him to be executed, piercing Mary's soul with the sword of a mother's anguish. As I said, this could well be prophecy. But I also wonder if, even more than that, it's Simeon speaking from experience. He knows from the Holy Spirit that Jesus is the Messiah and that he will bring great change. And in all his years of watching people be people, Simeon knows that change is painful and that those who bring change are often persecuted for it, which brings pain to those who love them. This is why I think Luke refers to this as a blessing, not a prophecy, even though it doesn't sound like much of a blessing. I imagine Simeon taking Mary's hand gently in his own and saying something like, You've got a holy troublemaker there. He'll do great things, but it won't be easy. Blessings for that painful road, child. I imagine him looking at her with love. Love. I think the thing I strive to learn best from my elders is how to love. Again, No generation is a monolith, and certainly I have known older folks who are bitter or never quite figured out love. But I know many who have placed love at the center of their lives, and in so doing found that flexibility for growth and change I described before. Flexibility which sometimes eludes their children. I remember in our senior year of high school, my best friend came out to his family as transgender. His parents took it very poorly, refusing for many months to accept what he had told them. But when he came out to his grandmother, she simply smiled at him and said, dear, I would love you even if you had a duck on your head. My friend isn't sure his grandmother ever quite understood transness, but it didn't matter. She loved him, no matter what, and was committed to figuring out what she needed to do to best show that love. On this New Year's Eve, while we are still in the midst of the Christmas season, the message is often that old things give way to new. A new year begins and the previous one is gone. Jesus is born and all is instantly different. And I think this is both true and not true. Yes, there are moments where we mark as beginnings and endings, like the transition of one year to another. And there are moments where something new definitely has begun, like the birth of a child, especially the Messiah. But in so many other ways, I think the old and the new bleed and blend together. And it's not always very clear where one thing ends and another begins. The wisdom and love of our elders is still with us, even after they pass on. The roots of a movement stretch far back in history before the history books say the movement began. 
Each moment is a new beginning of itself, and yet they often connect seamlessly together so that only a few feel like beginnings. And it's not only the things we value that stretch further into the past and the future than we know. So too, the things we would really like to end have a way of sticking around in one form or another. Jesus' birth and ministry did not end the oppression of the Jewish people, which is what many in his time hoped and believed would happen. Jesus came to bring peace, yet still today, war rages in Israel and Palestine, in Russia and Ukraine and beyond. And as Simeon knew, suffering and grief would visit this family, specifically because of the holy and good message of Jesus. I used to make New Year's resolutions to make a huge, almost personality-shifting change in my life. I told myself, New Year, New Me, and resolved to have completely different relationships with myself, my family, my body, my habits, you name it. And it never worked. And I believe that's not because big changes aren't possible, but because I can't pretend that the problems I've struggled with all my life will simply end when the clock strikes midnight on December 31st. I can and have changed and grown a great deal, but only when I remember that I am in fact the same me as I was yesterday and last year and 10 years ago. I am a me who has grown and changed, not become a different person. All of this to say, at every beginning, we are connected to the past. At every ending, we will take some of what we thought we were leaving behind. And what I learn from Simeon and Anna, from my friend's grandmother, and from many wise elders in my life is this. As we begin new things, let us begin them in love. As old things come to an end, let us carry forth the love. As we acknowledge that we are just as much ourselves today as we will be tomorrow, let us be a self who orients towards love. Throughout our past, present, and future, throughout our many beginnings and endings, there is God, the ever-present source of love. And I strive to love that God, my neighbors, and myself with all that I am and all that I have. I want to love the whole universe, even if it had a duck on its head. So friends, as this Christmas season ends, as this year ends, let us remember that endings and beginnings are hard to pin down. Let us choose wisely and how we wish to begin and what we wish to carry over from that which is ending. And with God's help, let us continue to choose love. Amen.
Friends, as one year ends and another begins, as the Christmas season gives way to Epiphany and to the rest of the church year, remember that we carry with us things that have ended and every beginning has a connection to the past. Remember to think carefully about what you would like to begin and what you wish to carry with you. And remember that God and love are eternal, present through all our beginnings and endings. Go forth and begin with love. Amen.